it's just, it's, it was stunning to me that all this could have happened in a week that we have, we have permanently, well, at least for the short term, probably the midterm permanently altered our world. And I don't know that any of us know what going back to normal is going to be like. You know, I was going through the newspapers today and uh, reading everything online about coronavirus and again, just trying to digest the, the latest news. And I came across this headline that I had to click on and it was, I can't believe how much coronavirus has changed America in a week. And I saw that one of my favorite columnists from the Detroit um, Free Press wrote it, Nancy Kaffer. And so she's with me now by Zoom. So we're both in our own places, but able to talk about this. Hey, Nancy, how are you? Hey, Christy, it's good to see you. It's great to see you too. So tell me a little bit about why you even wanted to write this. It really resonated with me because you even wrote on Facebook above it. This is so, this has been so difficult. Thank you so much for saying that. Now I, I just, it kept sinking into me. This has been one week. Like one week ago, I, mean, I was in our newsroom on um, Tuesday night waiting for primary results to come right. in. And this was the biggest concern I had. Would the yeah. primary be decisive? Would we have results tonight? Would, would people disagree with the, you know, how would I make my deadlines? Mm -hmm. And then about what, what was it around 10 o'clock, maybe that night? It was about 1045 because I was doing some work for the PBS news hour mm -hmm. and I was waiting to go on live at 11 and it was at 1045 that uh, Governor Whitmer came out and said we had our first two cases on Tuesday night and that just felt like it flipped everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, I did, I still didn't even get it that night, but then the next day, um, you know, I was still like, oh, I'll deal with this later. I've got to finish my election mop up. Right. And yeah, the, then the next day, uh, by the end of the week, our schools were closed. Our, we're, now a week later, we have restaurant closures where schools are closed at least till April. And I don't know anyone who thinks they're gonna reopen in three weeks as said, sorry, sorry if this hadn't occurred to you. No, but I think I, no, I sure hear it has. Three kids at home that are rattling around the house right now because I'm in my basement <laughs> doing this interview as you know, we're all either working from home and finding out different ways to be able to do stuff. Yeah, so you know, no dining in restaurants, um, movie theaters closed, spas closed. Um, I you know, the bus is shut down, which they're reopened. It seems to have been a lot of misunderstanding, but I got to say living in Detroit and knowing how many people rely on the buses to get to work, that felt cataclysmic to me. Like, are we gonna, you know, what are those folks gonna do for, for their pay? Are they gonna be, how many of people who rely on buses you know, work in grocery stores and other essential industries? Um, but look, luckily that one cleared up, but what's the next one? And then at the same time, I feel guilty for feeling so affected because I'm able to work from home. I have been on this obsessive food buying thing where I have more food in my fridge and pantry than I've probably ever had in my life. Right. And I'm still, is it enough? Do I have enough? You know? Yeah. I, I think there is that, that guilt of, you know, that there's somewhere along the line, someone has a little bit worse um, off than you do. And mm -hmm. I, but I, I do believe it's isolation that also is affecting all of us in a, in a bizarre way too. And, and it's just been a week. It's a week yeah. and things are going off the rails like this. This is, you know, I know I have friends who own small businesses who are having to close their doors or, or furlough or lay off their employees. Um, it's just, it's, it was stunning to me that all this could have happened in a week that we have, we have permanently, well, at least for the short term, probably the midterm, permanently altered our world. And I don't know that any of us know what going back to normal is going to be like. Yeah. And it feels like the phrase new normal is, is slightly flippant. Like I, I don't even know what the next 24 hours is going to bring. And I think that's what sometimes is so unsettling for people. And especially, um, you know, I've said that I have kids. I know that you have a child as well in talking about that. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like, well, what's going to happen next? And you're like, I can't even, I can't even make an estimated guess um, about what that, what that will look like. Yeah, I mean, I can, and then there's all these other pieces that like the stock market, things are happening. I can't even think about that stuff right now. It's like too complicated <laughs> and hard mm -hmm. and what that's going to mean for the long term future, you know, if we're doing social distancing and isolation, but you know, what's the, what's the trade off between people who can't work and, you know, what their risk is of coronavirus compared to can't pay the rent, can't eat. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, a, um, yeah, the, the, problem with, you're right, new normal sounds like kind of a flippant phrase, but the problem with trying to define it is that there's, or even use that phrase is we don't even know what this is, because what is going to be, what is going to be a week from now that right. we, we can't imagine what will happen, you know, now, and also, I, you probably saw the news that 
be, um, there's been a death. In Michigan? Mm-hmm. Which, which just like, sorry for throwing you off. <laughs> no, no, no. I was going to say, there, I thought you were going to talk about 4GM and Chrysler shutting down, but no, you've got... Yeah, that the first uh, the first death from coronavirus complications has been reported here in Michigan. And um, yeah, so where do we go from here? Let me ask you, so in, in, when you posted um, what you wrote, when you posted your column, what's been the, with the feedback or the discussions you're having online? Because I find now on social media, um, whereas I had abandoned Facebook a bit, um, mm -hmm. that Same. I feel like I'm gravitating back towards a little bit more. And I see so much more activity from people because... That that's where people are. Um, I sent an, I sent a note to two of my dear friends this morning who have just kind of been checking in on each other, and we're not seeing each other, of course. But I said I don't know if it's the coffee or what, but I'm just like totally just suffused with love for you guys and our yeah. community and the support right now. Because yeah, what you're saying, um, and it, there there is this. We are kind of reaching out to each other. I had, like you had stopped being on Facebook so much because it's not a very a comfortable place all the time mm -hmm. and okay. um and it is it is nice to see this community support i remember from the early days of the internet in the 90s it was so exciting to be able to be in touch with people um there was a guy who you know remember when diaries online diaries were popular yeah. there was some guy who lived in taiwan who shared this public online diary of his life and it was so fascinating to me because i've never been to taiwan i'll probably never go to taiwan and reading about how someone on the other side of the world grocery shops and and you know what their work day is like it was just it felt so connected and so like valuable for the human experience and then we you know kind of turned the internet into a toxic cesspit of you know angry people yelling at each other and what upsmanship <laughs> and yeah so wouldn't it wouldn't be bad if we got back to more of that community mm -hmm. human thing and i i hope that that happens here it really is a tool that we could use to walk in each other's shoes a little bit what have people been saying to you about what you wrote and saying uh, I, I i connect with this I've got, I've got a lot of really kind comments, like the ones you said, that this is how they're feeling and that they've been just spun by the fact that it's, it's so, so much has happened so quickly in their uncertainty. So people have been generally very kind about what they've said. And I, I'm, I'm just glad that something I was feeling, you know, I, I, I wrote on my little Facebook post, I said, I, I had to write it. And I actually even sent it to um, my editor, um, the amazing Jewel Gapwani, who you know. And I said, um, I wrote this. I had to write it. I don't know if we have to publish it. So you tell me if it's good. And she said, this is great. We're going to, you know, it's, it's exactly how people are feeling. So I had to write it. Um, I'm just glad that other people got something out of it. So going forward, Nancy, um, how do you, I guess, in this, in this time of uncertainty and the things are changing all the time, how do you decide what you're going to be writing on and, and how are you guys going forward with the editorial page and, and, and how that all works now? That's a really great question and one that I don't know that we have the answer to. You know, what we do on the Free Press editorial page is we generally try to be policy oriented and solutions driven. We try to have, we have a strong equity focus. So we're going to be informed by those things going forward. I will say that I don't know what the appetite right now is among readers. I mean, I think right now we're still very much in crisis. What's the latest news mode? What does it look like? What is what is happening? And I don't know that I don't know that readers necessarily want like, you know, here are the policy pieces we need to advance. Uh, but we're we're gonna we're gonna you know right now it's all hands on deck at the Free Press. Everyone's helping out. You know, it's also great if you've never worked in a newsroom. I know you have, but mm -hmm. anyone watching who's never worked in a newsroom, it is one of the best places to be in a crisis because um, just the way people work together and to see how our amazing team works and the selflessness that our breaking news reporters and our lead reporters on this story, like Kristen Seamus, um, just demonstrate in giving their time and giving themselves to bring people information is incredible and inspiring to be a part of. So right now we're kind of, um, all hands on deck, everyone's helping out however they can. But yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna continue to be informed by our priorities on the opinion page of smart policy, equity, and um, solutions, because we're going to need 
all of those things. We're going to need, we're going to need a lot of them. And uh, yeah, I want to also just say um, good job to the Detroit News and to Cranes and Bridge. Um, so many publications and so many reporters. Are now radio, yeah, everybody's around the, the park. Um, and keeping us informed yeah. while a lot of us are, you know, have to be home and, and are, are doing different things. But Nancy, I want to say thanks. And it's so good to see you. Um, to I know you. in a, in a very different, different way, but hopefully um, we can have you back on again and uh and share your voice and, and have these conversations anytime and uh, i hope to see you in real life again someday christy <laughs> find more at one detroit pbs.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our one detroit newsletter